Today, the topic is about cardiology, <clears throat> but it's, we're doing it in a way that it's not common in Grand Rounds, and that is, it's going to be delivered by a dynamic duo. It's going to be delivered by two partners that came together professionally to actually present what's the state of the art in this particular topic. And we have known about dynamic duos and professional partnerships throughout history in medicine and in science. And I'm going to tell you about just a few to get you pumped up for the presentation. And these few are people that you probably haven't heard much about, but you should think about. So let's remember Robert Columbus. Robert Columbus, with a G, was born on this day in 1914. And he was an American physiologist who, with his partner, Donald Griffin, confirmed that bats actually use echolocation to avoid obstacles while in flight. So they confirmed that bats can hear beyond the range of humans and that they use that sound to avoid obstacles when they fly uh, when it's dark. Charles Sumner Tainter, T-A-I-N-T-E-R, died on this day back in 1940 at the age of 85. He was an American inventor who actually invented a number of sound recording instruments. So with his partner, Alexander Graham Bell, you've heard about him, but you hadn't heard about Tainter, they developed the photophone, which was patent patented in 1880. And then they patented in 1886 the graphophone. I don't know what these things are, but he did that with Chichester A. Bell, which was a cousin of Alexander Graham Bell. And then we remember Ferdinand Brown, B-R-A-U-N, Brown, Brown, died on this day, 1918, age 67. Carl Ferdinand Brown was a German physicist, physicist who shared the Nobel Prize for physics in 1909. He did it with Guglielmo Marconi. And they, those two developed wireless telegraphy, wireless telegraphy. And here's somebody you should remember, Charles Friedel, F-R-I-E-D-E-L, died on this day in 1899 at age 67. So Friedel joined forces with another chemist, an American chemist, James Mason Crafts, to develop what's called the Friedel Crafts reaction. Have you heard about that? The Friedel Crafts reaction. As soon as I say, you say, well, I know what those are. These are reactions to substitute, to make substitutions in an aromatic ring. So if you acylate or acylate, those are Friedel Crafts reaction by the work of this French and these, this American chemist in this area. And finally, you have heard about posterization. So on this day, 1862, on this day, 1862, the first test of posterization was completed. So Louis Pasteur and Claude Bernard, the dynamic duel, on March 3, six weeks before, put jars full of dog poop and blood and urine and who knows what else in there and sealed them, heated them up and sealed them, and then left them in a corner and then walked on this day into the French Academy of Sciences and opened the jars. And nobody had to leave. In fact, there was no observable, obvious decay or fermentation. And they have proven they can do this by heating it up and doing a couple of other things, which later was used for beer. So now you can heat up beer, seal it up, and send it somewhere without refrigeration. And you can drink that beer be without developing sepsis. And then from there, it moved on to canned foods. And from there, it moved on to milk and so forth by the dynamic duo of Pasteur and Bernard. And with that, I leave you with Dr. Uh, Roberto Boli, who's going to introduce our speakers of the day. Thank you, Jesse. So uh, today we have a fairly unusual format with two speakers, uh, which will uh, share with you one of the amazing things that cardiologists do, because cardiologists do a panoply of really amazing things. Uh, if you look at what cardiology, right, uh, you, the three of us agree on that. If you look at what cardiology has done in the last 50 years has been absolutely extraordinary, right? We started out with cat cardiac catheterization and the CCU, the defibrillator, bypass surgery, coronary angioplasty, coronary stenting, percutaneous aortic valve replacement, and then came aspirin, and then beta blockers, and then ACE inhibitors, and then statin, and then electro electrical ablation of arrhythmias, left ventricular assist devices, and ablation of atrial fibrillation. But that's not enough. And we want to go further. And the next frontier is to prevent 
um, embolization in patients in patients with chronic atrial fibrillation uh, by closing the left atrial appendage, and that's what uh, the topic of today's grand rounds will be. So we have uh, two of our best faculty working together on this new frontier, uh, Dr. Marcus Stoddard and Dr. Rakesh Gopinathan Tanner, who have uh, uh, really uh, been at the forefront of this, uh, of this uh, area of research. So Marcus uh, is the longest serving faculty member in cardiology. He is also by far the most respected and established member of our faculty. He, uh, he has been here since 1988, uh, so almost 30 years. Congratulations, next year will be your anniversary. He graduated from Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins University and did his uh, training in medicine and uh, cardiology at uh, St. Louis University and then came to Louisville in 1988. He is director of the non-invasive labs at this hospital or the Ecolab at the VA at the Ecolab at Jewish Hospital. Uh, he has really built uh, a model of an Ecolab, which is the envy of the nation. I think our Ecolab here in this hospital, not many people realize that, is one of the best in the country. He's very well known nationwide. He's uh, regularly invited at uh, workshops of the American College of Cardiology uh, to develop uh, new standards for echocardiography or to teach uh, echocardiography or to develop tests for competence in echocardiography has published over a hundred papers is voted faculty of the year almost every year is, vo is voted best teacher of the year almost every year mm -hmm. I mean, he has been an incredible asset to our division our department and we're very very fortunate to have him he also works about 27 hours a day his rvus are about a thousand percent of average uh, and so he has an incredible amount of energy that uh, probably relates to some uh, SNP, some uh, single point mutation in mitochondrial DNA that gives you uh, unusual energy. But uh, it's amazing, he will read echoes at you know, midnight every night. He, he lives after I leave, it's, it's amazing. Uh, Dr. Gopinathan Nair uh, is um, uh, a graduate from the University of Kerala in India. He came to the States in uh, 2003 did his medicine residency at Hahnemann University in Philadelphia, and then his cardiology fellowship training and electrophysiology training at the University of Iowa. We were very fortunate to recruit him in 2010. He's director of electrophysiology in our division and uh, has also been appointed to a number of national positions. Uh, at the time of the Kentucky One uh, partnership, he was the leader of the electrophysiology uh, subcommittee in uh, the national organization of um, CHI. He's also a member of the electrophysiology subcommittee of the Clinical Council on Cardiology of the American Heart Association. He has been invited to speak at several meetings of the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, the Heart Rhythm Society, has published a very, very high profile review on uh, uh, tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy in general of the American College of Cardiology last year. So it has uh, really brought Louisville to a national level uh, in electrophysiology, which we did not have before. He's an outstanding teacher, incredible clinician, and so we are very, very thankful to him also for his contributions. So I will stop here, um, otherwise we will run out of time. <laughs> Marco. Good morning, thank you, Dr. Roman, Roberto, colleagues. Uh, the topic today is a very important one because this issue with atrial fibrillation has gone on for such a long time and we've struggled as clinicians to try to control many of the problems that it creates. One of which is, of course, thromboembolism. And we know basically the role of how to treat such patients and who should be treated. But we've evolved now where we now have percutaneous devices that will play a complementary role and certainly an adjutant role at this point for treatment of, anti, uh, of uh, for arrhythmia reduction. We have no disclosures to, to give today. And the date on that slide was wrong. It's 4-20-2017. This is what we're going to discuss. And I'm going to try to set the stage whereby you understand and appreciate why we need closure devices. And Rakesh will take it from there and then embellish that theme as he talks about the, uh, the closure devices. We know that atrial fibrillation has a high risk for thromboembolism. We know that the left atrial appendage is key in these patients with non-valvular atrial fib as a source of these clots causing embolization. 
and therefore that has to be the focus, the left atrial appendage. We know also in the true clinical world, the use of anticoagulation therapy is less than what it should be. And as a result, therefore, closure devices, other uh, techniques become very important. We'll look at the alternative roles with these non-pharmacological approaches. Rakesh will do that. He'll look at the watchman, the efficacy, the safety, per, uh, supported by the PREVAIL trial, the PROTECT AF trial, and CAP. And he'll look at other closure devices. And we'll look at what our, our future goals and directions. So here we are, 2017. Massive number of patients that have atrial fibrillation, six to eight million. This is a, a projected amount in 2000, I mean, 2050. Obviously, we won't be practicing then, but it's a tremendous amount. This is a tremendous burden that we have as clinicians, and this is only going to grow. As the population ages, we're going to see more and more patients with atrial fibrillation in their potential complications that occur. And what we're talking about today, of course, is focus. We know atrial fibrillation is a broad topic, has many comorbidities with it, one of which is thromboembolism and stroke. This is a graphic depiction of the severity of the problem. If you look at the CDC's depiction in 2007 to 2012, a graphic map with a dark red representing hospitalizations related to atrial fibrillation. Tremendous number of patients are being admitted yearly. Uh, 750,000 hospitalized per year during this, not doing that just per year, during that data set collection. And you can see in Kentucky, we are probably 10 times uh, greater on average, so 64 to 70,000 hospitalizations per year related to atrial fibrillation. So, and many of these are related to patients who present sometimes for the first time with their stroke. So, stroke itself can be the first presentation for atrial fibrillation. This is a well known to all of us that atrial fibrillation is a disease of, old, of, el, of getting older. Uh, why that's the case, there's a lot of different explanations for it. Also, there's a gender preference as well. So women are more predisposed to develop atrial fibrillation as they age. And as you look at 90-year-old, we're talking 40, 45% will develop atrial fibrillation, a tremendous number. And if you look at the population in general, the cause, atrial fibrillation is the leading cause of ischemic stroke. 25% of the ischemic strokes are related to atrial fibrillation. So again, then, it points out the important magnitude of understanding where these strokes come from. We know anticoagulation is important, but we need to know also what else can be done to improve it. Look at this slide. You can see why, lower right panel, this is an aerial view of a left atrial appendage. And those little mobile densities in there are clots. So 3D rendering of a left atrial appendage. This appendage doesn't function. Usually the, the appendage should be contracting. Uh, when it's dysfunctional, the stasis develops, and you have clot formation. That's the 3D of a left atrial appendage in a patient with atrial fibrillation. And this is what they have, these large strokes. Uh, let me use my, these large strokes. And this is a, a, a MRI scan showing a large stroke in the middle cerebral artery distribution, the classic embolic territory. And this data is old data, Copenhagen SPAV trial, looking at how many of these strokes that do present related to atrial fib are devastating strokes, disabling or fatal. So it's a huge population that come in with these strokes. They're going to be disabling or fatal in over 40%, close to half of these patients. The focus then is going to be the left atrial appendage and the left atrium in general. About 75% or more of the, of the thrombi uh, that come are in the left atrium in these patients. And the focus is the left atrial appendage itself. Take a look at this. You can see why this is a patient who's at risk to develop a massive stroke. This is a mobile thrombus in the left atrial appendage, a dysfunctional appendage. And greater than 90% of the clots that form in the left atrium form in the left atrial appendage in patients with non-valvular AFib. So once again, setting the stage for the focus being the left atrial appendage. This is our CHAD VAS scoring system that we use as clinicians to try to risk stratify the risk of stroke. And you're obviously very familiar with this, the various components. I won't go through them one by one, but this gives us an aggregate clinical assessment of the likelihood of ischemic stroke per year. And this is going to be important in terms of identifying those individuals or candidates for percutaneous closure devices. So I'll just put that up there as that. 
The recommendations are for anticoagulation for these patients. If you're CHAD-VAS1 or CHAD-VAS2 or greater, is either the NOACs or the warfarin-based type anticoagulants. And most of all of the guideline trials, American Heart, American College of Cardiology, the uh, Heart Rhythm Society, and European Society. So no one's really debating the need for anticoagulation in these sort of patients who have these kind of risk factors. Chad Vass 1 even in many uh, recommendations, but certainly Chad Vass 2 or greater. But for some reason, even though they're effective, anticoagulation, which results in a 68% risk reduction in stroke from patients with non-valvular AFib, on an average 6.8% per year, can be reduced to 2.1% per year. Despite all of that and massive data supporting it, it's not used fully. This is a graph showing the use of anticoagulation, NOACs, as well as warfarin. Warfarin in the green bars, NOACs in the gold bar. And if you look at the CHAD-VAS scores, these are certainly patients that should be anticoagulated. Less than half are receiving anticoagulation. So that's not news to you. I mean, you struggle with this issue just as well as I do. It's a big decision to decide to anticoagulate a patient. And usually because we're concerned about bleeding. We're concerned that this older patient is going to have bleeding problems um, on this anticoagulants. So we always embellish the hemor hemorrhagic complications of these patients. The elderly patients greater than 80, prior GI bleeds, fall risk. What we've done, though, is probably overemphasize the bleeding risk of anticoagulants. And we, for that reason, tend to use them less than we, we probably should, explaining some of that 50% use of the anticoagulants when it should be higher. But despite that, this is going to continue. No person talking to a clinician telling them you should use it more is going to necessarily make the difference or turn the tide. You are going to be concerned about an individual patient that shows back up in your office, got a hospitalization for a GI bleed on anticoagulation, and you're always thinking as a clinician, do no harm. So you're very concerned about that. Despite that, um, you're concerned about using anticoagulation. So here's the, chat, the HASBLAT score that helps us in risk stratifying patients who are likely to have bleeding per year. And these are the components of it. It doesn't capture everything we know as a clinician that's going to predispose to bleeding, but hypertension, abnormal renal function, liver disease, stroke, previously major bleed prior, label INRs, which happens probably in 40% of our patients on warfarin, age greater than 65, et cetera. And it's only so good. If you get a HASBLAT score of 5, 12.5% chance of bleeding per year. Beyond that, there's very little data that justifies or actually confirms the accuracy of the HASBLAD scoring system. But that's important because that's going to be one of the components of selecting patients. If you have NOACs, even those medications, if you look at patients who should receive anticoagulation on a span of two years, about 30% are no longer on those anticoagulants, even the NOACs, and also is much worse, or much less for warfarin uh, in terms of long-term use. So adherence to these anticoagulations is, uh, is not easy, whether it's a NOAX. A NOAX is not necessarily the answer to warfarin. It's certainly a major clinical benefit that we have and alternative that we have because of some concerns about warfarin. But still, if you look at this graphics, patients fall off in their use over time. So other approaches are going to be needed. So this sets the rationale uh, for why we need non-pharmacologic alternatives to anticoagulation. Major bleeding from the oral anticoagulation, there's an inability to maintain INRs and a good selection of our patients that we treat with warfarin, noncompliance, refusal of taking the medications because of their known side effects, medication conditions, occupations, lifestyle, all these things are factors in why patients don't necessarily continue on anticoagulants and pharma non-pharmacologic based treatments to prevent thromboembolism is necessary. That will set the, the, the patients that we would consider for a potential watchman. HASBLAT scores that we discussed with you, three or greater. Patients at fall risk. Patients on antiplatelet therapy, dual antiplatelet therapy, Plavix, aspirin, plus need anticoagulation. That's a patient that you've increased, you ratchet up the risk for anticoagulation, and you can look for a different alternative that may be helpful. All right, so this is the answer partly. In terms of atrial fib, no one single thing will ever be the answer. But we're going to, this is the device, the Watchman device. This is an aerial view of the left atrial appendage. See if I can get that to play. 
All right. Well, we're looking down on it. So the question is, how do you get this circular object into this oval-shaped hole? That's the orifice of the left atrial fibula. This is some various modifications in different geometry of the left atrial appendage. So you need a device that's very, uh, that will allow you to adapt to different morphology. You need a device that can span the sizes of the appendage. Right now, the Watchman device goes from a 21 millimeter to a 33 millimeter, and this is what it looks like, and it's put into the left atrial appendage. It basically is compressed by the appendage, but it sort of reconfirms the, the shape of the appendage, making it circular. Uh, anywhere from a 21 to a, I'm sorry, a 17 to a 31 millimeter size appendage is a patient that could have a watchman. This is a fun part about doing echo. This is a chicken wing. <laughs> this is a left atrial appendage and has a morphology that's similar to a chicken wing, and that's what it's called. We have different morphologies, broccoli, cactus, et cetera, and there are the challenges. Not only is the size of the orifice important, but the morphology is also important, so you need a device that will adapt to it. And with that said, I'm going to hand this off to my able colleague <laughs> to carry on from here, and we'll see what we can do for further treatment of these patients. It's hard to get on. Let me help you, sir. You got it. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you. So, <coughs> so let's uh, uh, um, thank you, Marcus, and uh, thank you, Dr. Boli, for the kind introduction. Um, just we're going to move on to the procedural part of the um, more of the uh, what kind of closure devices are available and what's the data behind it. So essentially, uh, these are the available left atrial appendage closure devices. So we can broadly classify them as percutaneous and also surgical. Surgical, open surgical has been done for a long time, for decades. And uh, um, fortunately, many of them are not the greatest techniques to completely occlude them. And the, the one that we're going to talk about mostly today is the only one that is currently FDA approved, which is a watchman device. Mm, uh, and there is another one called Amplatzer Cardiac Plug, which is in trial and hopefully soon be approved too. Then there is the ligation devices, mm, which are which kind of uh, snare the appendage from like an epicardial or from the outside part of the heart. And, um, and there is a newer uh, development in the surgical side is something called atriclip, which especially if you're going for like mitral valve surgery or something, they usually instead of trying to do the stapling and excision that mm, surgeons used to do in the old days, they usually use this uh, clip called atroclip, which kind of mm, compresses and necrosis the appendage. So what is, um, what is a watchman, basically? So it's, it's basically uh, an umbrella-shaped device, which is an, made of a component called nitinol, uh, frame and it has a bunch of anchors. Mm, it also has a cap which is made of a substance called polyethylene terephthalate and basically it, it radially exerts pressure against the appendage from inside out and this particular uh, net will capture any thrombi that may form and prevent mm, de them from getting out of the appendage and eventually once you implant it the endothelium will kind of grow over it and closes it. And that's kind of the idea, basically. So what are the indications for Watchman currently? So the Watchman device is indicated to reduce the risk of thromboembolism in non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So what's non-valvular? So non-valvular is anything except moderate to severe mitral stenosis or mitral valve repair or replacement. So anything valvular atrial fibrillation has to do with the mitral valve and um, that anything other than that is non-valvular. So you have to have a moderate risk of um, stroke uh, and that is defined by a CHATS2 vascular greater than, or no, greater than or equal to three. You have to be eligible for short-term anticoagulation at least 45 days of uh, um, warfarin is what usually you recommend it. So even if you have like a GI bleed or something, if you can get you through 45 days, then they are home free after that. 
and they should have an appropriate rationale for a non-pharmacologic alternative to oral anticoagulation. As Dr. Stoddard was mentioning, there were multiple. You have had prior bleed, you have had triple therapy with the dual antiplatelets or any other thing. Cannot maintain the NINR, some mm, bruising or a high bleeding risk or so on and so forth. So it's a broad category, but uh, that is something a clinician has to decide. Uh, what are the contraindications? The, there are very few. Uh, one is unfavorable anatomy. Mm, if, if you don't have enough depth in the left atrial appendage, um, you cannot really implant a device. The second thing is that if you already have a thrombus, you cannot, mm, you have to wait for the thrombus to clear. The reason behind it is that you have to uh, place a sheath into the left atrial appendage to implant the device. And so if you already have a thrombus, it's, uh, it can, mm, uh, you know, dislodge the clot. And lastly, if you, at the current, uh, uh, as we speak today, uh, if you have an absolute contraindication like a prior brain bleed or something like that, and uh, we are not allowed to use it right now because of this requirement for warfarin for 45 days after that. But there are trials coming, and we'll talk about it a little later, that will mm, uh, hopefully allow us to do this in the near future. So how do we do this? So it's a one-time implant. There is no change out, nothing. Uh, it's basically done in the cardiac EP lab. Usually we, are, we currently do it at, mm, in the EP lab. Uh, it's performed by a heart team, much like percutaneous aortic valve. It has an mm, electrophysiologist or interventional cardiologist, an expert echocardiographer general, under general anesthesia. And usually um, the, those are the main team, basically. So uh, the procedure is done through the right femoral vein most of the time and uh, percutane completely percutaneous. It's a 14 French sheet um, and uh, there are a couple of varieties of the sheet used and, and then you do what we call as a transseptal puncture. So you puncture the interatrial septum percutaneously and then go into the left side. I'll show you some videos on that. And um, the device is implanted mm, something like that in the ostium, the left atrial appendage. Uh, and then once you implant, you can release the score wire and then it'll stay there. Uh, it's a one hour procedure typically and they stay overnight, go home the next day. And then uh, after the procedure, so this is kind of the peri-procedural and coagulation. So patient is um, at implant, we usually keep them on warfarin. We do it with an INR of two to three and they may or may not be on baby aspirin, it's okay. Uh, from the implant till 45 days, they need to continue warfarin, trying to maintain an INR around two. And then after 45 days, you need to be on Flavix and aspirin, dual antiplatelet therapy. In the trials, they did it for six months, but three months would suffice. And then after that, uh, it's a physician's choice. It's recommended that they take at least some aspirin after that indefinitely. Um, but if you really cannot take it, it's okay without it too. So those, those are kind of the very procedural. So by 45 days, they get a transesophageal echo, and if the device is well treated and no leak, you can stop warfarin. So somebody can, if there is a GI bleed or something that can get them through 45 days, they should be able to, um, you know, come uh, stop their oral anticoagulation. And you can, uh, in certain circumstances, use NOAX also post-device, although uh, there has not been any randomized studies using NOAX as an option. And um, so what are the procedural safety issues? There is always, any time we do all these appendages, not the, um, you know, it's a, it can be thin at times, and so there's bleeding issues. It can, there is a risk of, small risk of pericardial effusion, uh, the risk of stroke has been pretty much 0.1 or close to zero, the procedural stroke. Um, and peri device leak can happen, again, small risk device related thrombus can happen in the first 45 days sometimes. And also embolization is also extremely, extremely rare. So if you ask me what are the cumulative risk for complication rate is about, right, uh, right now it's about one to one and a half percent. And there is about a one percent uh, to 1.2 percent chance of pericardial effusion during deployment of the device. And uh, so that has come down a lot from the original trial. Let's talk about a case. This was our sort of a, one of the early Watchman patients. So it's an 87-year-old male with uh, permanent atrial fibrillation. Um, he has a CHATS2 VAS score of 5. Age, he had a prior stroke, which gives you two points, and hypertension. Age also gives you two points. 
And so, we, if we calculate the stroke risk, it's about 6.7 for the CHAT2 VASC, but with the CHAT2 score, which we used to use before, it is sort of slightly higher. So, he has a half blood, it's like a bleeding risk calculator um, of five. He has age, stroke, GI bleed, hypertension, and antiplatelet use. He had a prior GI bleed. He has a 12.5 percent per year major bleed risk and 1.2 percent intracranial bleed risk. So, he was taken off warfarin by his primary care physician because of his mm, uh, recurrent issues with GI bleeding. So, uh, but he was confirmed mm, after evaluation that he's okay for short-term anticoagulation, but may not be a good candidate for long-term anticoagulation. So, this is kind of the sort of the patient that you do. I mean, this GI bleed can, uh, some people may have frequent falls, they may pass out, all those kind of things. And so, mm, and so in this patient, so this is, uh, kind of um, the walking through your procedure. This is an uh, intracardiac echo, um, and this is a left atrium, interatrial septum. This is thin membrane. So, um, then you actually use a sharp needle to puncture the interatrial septum. Um, uh, you can see the um, needle tenting the septum. And then you place a, um, a catheter into the left atrium, um, and the, we told you the 14 French, the big sheep, into the left atrium. And then we, um, you know, do, uh, Dr. Storer, who's our echocardiographer, will give us the views of the appendage, uh, where you look at the depth, mm, as in, we look at it in multiple views, make sure there is no thrombus. We also size the appendage and see what kind of device we need to use. This is a view of uh, a catheter into the appendage, whether we are putting the sheath into the appendage, getting ready for deployment. And once we are in the appendage, we're going to do a quick angiogram, which is what we see, and this is a pigtail catheter injecting dye. As you can see, the, it lights up the appendage and uh, uh, it washes out here on the mitral side. So, you uh, try to get a sense of how d deep it is, what kind of lobes does it have, and all those kind of things. And then, once you are confirmed, we advance the sheet all the way up here. And then, you, as you can see, uh, it'll, uh, it, uh, you deployed let me just play that one more time. So, this is kind of how it looks. It kind of has a strawberry shape when it deploys. And um, uh, this is the ostium of the appendage. This is the rest of the appendage. And then after that, we usually inject, uh, we take a look at the echo. So, this is kind of how the device sits in the ostium. And it completely covers from this edge to uh, this far edge. This is the what we call the coumadin grid. And uh, this, uh, it sits pretty well there. Then we make some measurements and make sure inject some more dye, make sure there is no uh, clear leak in there, and then we release the device. So that's kind of um, the procedure. It's uh, it's not a super complicated procedure, but it's you know it's it's it requires collaboration with the um, echo anesthesia and um, the the procedure is in that regard. So, this is, the, this is the same patient 45 days after. So, mm, you can see that the device is still, uh, this, this, if I can draw this, this is the appendage here, and this is the ostium right here. And you can see the device is still sitting pretty well in the appendage, and there was no leak in this patient. So, this patient has been taken off warfarin. He's only on aspirin now. He's been almost uh, six months, uh, four or five months, and it's been doing very well in, in that regard with, with no further bleeding complications at all. So, um, this is all good, like great case, you know, uh, but what, what about the data? Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you, Watchman is one of the very well studied um, devices that we have. There has been um, two big randomized trials comparing Watchman against Warfarin. And uh, over, um, right now, the, in trials, we have 2,000 plus patients and almost 10,000 implanted worldwide mm, over the past several years. And um, the mainly, I'm going to talk about PROTECT study, which is the first uh, randomized trial for Watchman. And we're also going to talk about PREVAIL, which is a second randomized trial that they did. So, what about the device success, implant success? So, if you look at various studies, uh, a successful implant means you're going to implant a device, it mm, positions well, and you're able to mm, mm, without any major issues. And so, in, in multiple studies, it has anywhere ranged from 
Um, in the original study, it was low because of the learning curve, and it's been anywhere from 95 to 98 percent, and so, which is what we have seen in our experience too. And so, uh, it's pretty successful in plant overall. So, Protect AF was a prospective randomized multi-center study of 707 non-valvular AF patients who were randomized two, in a two-to-one fashion to the Watchman device and Warfarin. And the primary efficacy endpoint was the composite of stroke systemic embolism and death. And so safety endpoint was major bleeding or any procedure related complications. So they, these patients, um, in this particular study, only 88% had a successful implant. Many of the techniques that we use now were not available in Protect AF at that time. And so they had a higher procedure related complication and lower success. And about 86% were successfully discontinued warfarin at uh, 45 days. And um, um, after the, this much follow-up, uh, there was 3% who had a, um, efficacy even stroke or death in the wa wa watchman arm compared to 4.9 for um, warfarin. So uh, just wanted to mention that this was a non-inferiority design, so, um, but still the relative risk reduction was there and it was not inferior. However, the, this was sort of offset by a higher safety issues in the initial trial, um, especially with pericardial effusions with, uh, without using some of the techniques that we use. So in order to address the safety, there are two concerns raised after PROTECT. One was, can everybody do it? Or is it going to be a very specialized group of people who can do it? Number two was, how can we bring the safety part down? We already kind of established the efficacy in this in case. So that's why they did um, uh, the second trial called PREVAIL. So here they took 407 patients, same inclusion criteria, randomized to Watchman and Warfarin, and then 25% of the patients were treated by new operators. And then um, they looked at the same outcomes. The implant success was much higher, from 88% to 95%. And uh, overall, um, uh, safety events came down from 7.4% to 2.2. And the, especially the pericardial effusions was 4.8% in PROTECT, and it came down to 1.5% um, uh, in PREVAIL. So uh, it also, and interestingly, there was no significant difference in outcomes between the new operators and the experienced operators. So that also uh, provided more impetus into um, um, the utility of the device. So this was the average Mm, sort of the um, chats, the, when the, these trials were mm, conducted, we did not have the chats to VAS, which we use now. We only had the chats to score. And the mean chats to scores were 2.2 and 2.6 for protect and prevail. So they, these are moderate risk population. Um, uh, and uh, with, uh, you know, some of them, I mean, some of them being pretty high risk too. So, mm, so it's a very representative population that we see. And then, what about long-term follow-up? So once, this is the data on four-year follow-up with the PROTECT study. And as you can see, as time goes on, uh, even uh, wa wa watchmen kind of, the curves tend to separate. And in, this is the primary efficacy endpoint, the composite of stroke, systemic embolism, and death. And you can see that there is a mortality, uh, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a difference in the primary efficacy endpoint. And if this is a safety stuff. So as you can see, when we originally started PROTECT, there was a higher safety events in the device. And with um, over time, once those who got successful implant, their bleeding risk um, is much um, significantly better because you're not using any anticoagulation going forward. And to add to the point, uh, if you look at just ischemic strokes alone, they were, again, initially they uh, were high because there were um, very procedural strokes, and they eventually got better over time in this um, uh, in the device population. Whereas, uh, if you look at cardiovascular mortality, significant uh, advantage for um, the Watchman device at four years, almost like a 60% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. And the cardiovascular mortality in this case is primarily driven by reduction in hemorrhagic stroke and stroke-related death. And so that is. Uh, and then if you look at total mortality also, there is about a 34% reduction. Again, fully driven by this part, basically. So how do you summarize all this? So at, at four-year follow-up, the Watchman device was as good as Warfarin for, uh, if you look at all strokes, basically. 
Uh, it has a 60% reduction in cardiovascular mortality at four years and about a 34% reduction in uh, uh, significant reductions in, in uh, all-cause mortality. And the bleeding risk, uh, although initially in the initial protect trial was higher, and they, uh, even at, at long-term follow-up, the bleeding, the bleeding risks are also um, equivalent to warfarin in that regard. So this was a patient-level meta-analysis that they did on about 500 and, uh, sorry, 2,400 patients um, with almost 6,000 6, patient years of follow-up, uh, including the PROTECT trial, the PREVAIL trial, and the prospective registry. And so these are sort of the take-home points. So if you look at the efficacy, which is a composite of all these, um, as efficacious as uh, warfarin uh, in preventing, if you look at all stroke, pretty dead even. If you look at ischemic stroke, slightly higher in the watchman arm, but, mm, uh, uh, but mm, it is completely offset by the almost 80% uh, reduction in hemorrhagic stroke going forward. And, uh, mm, and even uh, unexp and the CV death is also about 52% better. If you look at all cause mortality in this meta-analysis was uh, mm, uh, not statistically significant, still about 27% less. And all major bleeding, mm, uh, if you take from all intention to treat people, they are the same. But if you look at after the procedure bleeding, uh, they, they, have, they are almost 50% better in that regard. So this is another example of the bleeding issue. So this is um, post-procedure, from implant up to six months. If you look at the bleeding in the watchman group, it's about 5.9% and the warfarin group is 11.3%. So because 45 days, most of them stop it. However, uh, if you look at long term, after six months, then it's, it's come down 3% to 9% in the warfarin arm. So again, significant differences. So it makes sense because once you're off the anticoagulant, we don't have to use it anymore. And so any futuristic bleeding complications is going to be significantly less. So what about patients who have absolute contraindications? So that has always been an issue. We, have, we, have, we all have those patients, you know, major bleeding cannot even tolerate anything in that regard or any anti or land acquisition. So this is a <clears throat> this is not a randomized study. A randomized study is ongoing. And this is a prospective um, single arm study that looked at safety of <clears throat> watchmen, uh, sorry, safety and efficacy of watchmen in this population. So this was a uh, very high risk population. It's a chat tube as of 4.4 um, and they, instead of warfarin, after the procedure, they got six months of um, uh, Plavix or a similar kind of drug and lifelong aspirin. They, mm, if you look at the stroke rate um, over follow-up, if you look at the stroke rate over follow-up, it was about 2.3%. And uh, with this particular cohort, they're stroke rate without any medication should have been roughly about 7.7%. So it came down from 7.7 to 2.3 and uh, just using aspirin and Plavix. And that in, uh, that in itself is about a 67% uh, reduction. So um, there were, um, uh, again, adverse events were higher in this population. Um, and you can see that the hemorrhagic strokes are significantly less um, and uh, ischemic stroke was about 1.7. So uh, what this is, a, this is an initial study. What it shows is that it's feasible to do watchmen without post-procedural anticoagulation in this high-risk population and still derive a close to 67 to 70% reduction in uh, overall stroke. And so th this would be explored further, so, but that has an there's an option too. So overall, <clears throat> we have been asked initially to use warfarin for all post-procedure patients during this 45-day period. But what about NOACs? Can we use them? Um, this is a multi-center study that looked at about 214 patients receiving post-procedure NOAC after a watchman implant. And they, the peri-procedure complications are exactly the, mm, uh, exactly the same. They were not much different. So, and if you look at the composite of uh, device based uh, in a thrombus, a thromboembolic hemorrhoid was not non-significant. Again, small study, but suggests that you can use NOAC. One thing that we are not really clear is that all these trials were done against warfarin. 
what mm, you know you the natural question comes up is what if we use no action instead of often you're going to see this much benefit we don't know that information would be interesting to know but irrespective of that you know the, we are doing this for a patient who really cannot take oral anticoagulation long term so we are not advocating this as a first line therapy but as an alternative if you cannot do long term and i mean that applies to no acts too and I, actually as mark has said uh, about 30 percent of the people on no acts stop it at two year mark so there is a you know they're not perfect either so but that is something that uh, may need to be studied down the road in um, in my opinion so then we may ask, okay, this is a device, mm, big time procedure, they see, see in, the, uh, in the hospital, what about cost effectiveness? So this is an analysis from, um, uh, regarding cost effectiveness. So this compared mm, Watchman, mm, which is uh, this curve, LAAC, and um, Warfarin is this red one, and uh, NOAC is this green one. So they looked at 20 years of follow-up, they assumed that, and they looked at data from the, all the major randomized studies for all the NOACs and Watchmen and looked at event rates, mm, cost of the device and procedure, and, and the cost of maintaining NOAC therapy going forward and also running a Coumadin clinic. So, uh, and they looked at uh, quality of life um, earned per year. The, so first let's look at mm, appendage closure versus warfarin. So that is this versus this. So as you can see that at by year seven, which is right here, the mm, uh, wa watchman becomes cost effective. As you can see, the when we start warfarin, there's not a whole lot of cost, but over time there's still cost because of, you know, bleeding related hospitalizations or, uh, you know, mm, uh, just by getting the blood check done. And so by seven years, watchman was um, mm, uh, superior to uh, so it was cost effective compared to warfarin. How about NOACs? So NOACs is this guy. So again, not a whole lot of um, uh, cost to begin with, but over time, mm, pretty significant cost. And so mm, if you compare appendage closure versus NOACs, it actually by year five, you're cost effective. And then by e even by year five, Watchman becomes dominant. And um, so, as you can see, the cost difference at the end of this. Again, these are, there are a lot of assumptions that are usually made in cost effectiveness analysis, and it's a complicated model, but, uh, but this, it's promising information to say that this, you know, it's, a, it's kind of sort of a one and done procedure, and you don't need to have any problem, you know, bleeding related issues or hospitalizations down the road, and that may save money over time for the healthcare system. So what else is out there? So this is, we are talking about Watchmen. So there are other type of devices. This is called Amplaster. It's kind of like, a, it has a two disc, like it has a proximal disc and a distal disc. So it kind of um, closes the appendage with the distal disc and the proximal disc kind of sits inside the appendage. And so this is undergoing trial. There are a couple of advantages uh, to this device, mostly with the type of anatomy. And also there is some data that the leak is much less within this device. So this is an example of um, implant. So as you can see, the, the distal disc is sitting inside the appendage and the proximal disc. And you can see that the appendage is kind of closed, like almost with like a um, you know, jar with a lid, basically. So, mm, and so this is another opportunity coming down the road or alternative mm, like, um, procedure. Then uh, let's look at, uh, this is another mm, uh, device that is available. We don't do it right now here. It's called a lariat device. It's kind of used as a snare. So um, this is an endocardial and epicardial procedure. So you go femoral, go transeptal in endocardially to the left atrium. And then you have to do pericardial axis and bring a sheath in. It's an interesting concept. There are two magnetic wires, one coming endocardially and one coming epicardially. And they kind of meet in the middle. And then through that rail, you drop a snare over the appendage all the way to the ostium and which is guided by a balloon sitting here and then you kind of cinch the appendage and then mm, uh, cut the snare off and that actually kind of sort of um, you know uh, necrosis the uh, ostium of the appendage over time and uh, uh, so one advantage of this is that in addition to closure uh, it also can um, reduce arrhythmias from the appendage, which uh, it can be, appendage can be a trigger for atrial fibrillation and 
about 15, 20 percent of the patients and so that it's an additional. But the disadvantage is that it's a more complicated, more complicated procedure and so, um, you know, and the, side of, uh, the procedural risk is higher. And there are many, many um, devices in development. It's a very advancing field. We, I call it the appendageology. That's like it's been like a thing. There are many devices that are in trials that have claimed superiority in one way or the other. But this field is rapidly growing as the, um, you know, the non-invasive, sorry, the, in the non-pharmacological way of uh, preventing strokes in atrial fibrillation with multiple procedures. So, in conclusion. A significant proportion of non-valvular AF patients who need oral anticoagulation are either not on it or cannot take one for long term. So that is established. Left atrial appendage is a primary source for non-valvular AF-related thromboembolism. Percutaneous appendage closure is a promising alternative to anticoagulation in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation who are at high risk for bleeding or having contraindications to oral anticoagulation. Watchman is currently the only FDA approved percutaneous left atrial appendage closure device in the U.S. Although the other stuff that I show, they are all approved in Europe. They are always lagging behind them in this. And Watchman, however, has the most data and the only one with randomized data showing um, um, that I, I shared with you. The indication uh, is to be moderate to high risk of stroke. If you have a, if you have an atrial fibrillation patient with a CHATS2 VASC of three or more, and uh, with any relative contraindication to long-term anticoagulation, it could be bleeding, it could be false, it could be high Haspelet score. If you are like a UPS pilot who needs oral anticoagulation, they cannot. They need to be. Um, they may. That's a reasonable alternative, or any job-related things like that. Randomized trials have proved the efficacy and safety of Watchman compared to Warfarin. We, what we don't know is that whether, mm, is, uh, uh, so the, what we know right now is that it's equivalent for total stroke, it's superior for hemorrhagic stroke, and superior for cardiovascular mortality, mm, and even all-cause mortality, it's, uh, it's much mm, uh, better than Warfarin. And uh, several new devices are being developed with some undergoing randomized studies as the exciting field of appendageology continues to evolve. And gaps in knowledge still exist. We don't know whether there is uh, uh, how left atrial appendage closure compares to NOACs. Appropriate use of uh, left atrial appendage closure and with an absolute contraindications, and those things need a further study. And with that, I will conclude and uh, thank you for your attention. No, overall mortality is better. Cardiovascular, cardiovascular mortality is better. Cardiovascular mortality is better, but I thought overall mortality was about the same. Do I have that wrong? So in the, you're right now, the one of the, one randomized trial at four-year follow-up showed the overall mortality was about 34 percent less and was significant. In the meta-analysis, it was 27 percent less, uh, relative risk reduction. But the, mm, uh, but the p-value was like borderline, basically. So you can take it whichever way you want. But I, I guess this question will sort of uh, sort itself out with longer-term follow-up, basically. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm a pulmonologist. I come from the era where we put filters on everybody, and then we realized that probably not a good idea long-term. So related to this, is this paid by insurance? Yes, Medicare will cover it, mm, and there is... Uh, so again, as I said, it's a, uh, we have to satisfy those criteria that I listed, and we have to enroll these patients in a prospective registry, and uh, Medicare pays for it. As of now, we are having, uh, the, even though it's been more than a year since Medicare started covering it, the, our private insurers still haven't caught up much. We are having issues with them in terms of coverage. We have been able to get some approved, but mm, others are still a challenge. So I think uh, as time goes, they will have to get on the bandwagon. There is a great possibility 
the new technology enhances or worsens health disparities. And it's because of insurance premiums, mm -hmm. it's because of access, it's because of it's easy for me to sit at home and take a pill that costs very little than you can here at the brewery from just like eating some pizza. Uh, so it's something that we need to keep aware of. But this is really exciting. This is really exciting. Questions and comments? Yes, sir. It was uh, uh, the first trial was about uh, almost close to a two year follow up, 1.8 years median. So we will learn more than that. And the Protect Now has about four year follow up that is published. Mm, and uh, that is this one that I showed you. Sorry, uh, if I can go faster. Well, that's four year follow up. So this is a four year follow up. Okay. And, um, uh, and this is what I was so showing. Um, we have done close to 20, and uh, the first 13 patients are already off of warfarin, and uh, uh, everybody is doing well so far, and uh, it's a continuing being active program. We have two watchman days, like every first and third Wednesdays we do watchman, and that's kind of how we do. And uh, the original studies, I guess the... Um, the, the PI, Vivek Reddy, who is like the original PI for this trial, he said Mount Sinai in New York. And uh, so they, they probably are the sort of the, mm, I guess, if, if at all, they started this original studies, basically. Uh, PROTECT was an international study. There were 60 centers internationally. So I think, uh, I guess whoever was participating in the original PROTECT trials, where uh, they, they usually mm, have the most experience in that regard. So the mean age in the Watchman studies were, was 72 mm, years of age, and they had a CHATS2 score of about 2.6. So they are pretty moderate risk, actually. And uh, if you look at that data, they had um, at least um, somewhere in the range of 6 to 7% stroke risk per year. What, what, one of the things that's very clear is when you're enrolled in a clinical trial, your survival goes up. And that's because you're followed more closely. I mean, everybody is following you periodically, just the way probably we would ideally like to follow patients. In reality, <coughs> that may not work. So translating this to the real world may be a little bit difficult. But yeah, I, I think that this sort of reflected the patients we do see. And with you know this kind of follow-up that the trials provide, this is sort of outcomes you would expect. But in fact, as you get older, certainly the, 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 the risk of bleeding, all these other complications are higher. Yes. Yeah, Mark has made a great point, and that is that if you're in a clinical trial, you have better I think so, yes. Uh, it is, uh, a MRI should be fine. Because it's, uh, it's uh, see, after what happens after 45 days is that it's fully endothelialysis. I would wait 45 days at least, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's fully endothelialysis, and uh, it kind of, you know, after in a few months, it kind of looks like it's not, not even there, basically. And it's there, but the in, in the, yeah, yes. It, it, you're okay with MRI after that. Uh, the question was that what is it about the architecture of the appendage that, uh, um, you know, makes it like a sort of a beacon for thrombus? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's 
uh, obviously multiple answers to that question. And I don't think we know all the answers because there's probably three different factors in general that hypercoagulability is going to be an issue and the stasis that's in the appendix is going to be an issue. Inflammation, all these sort of things are going to be aggregate. It's not going to be just one single thing. But the appendix itself, it's a dynamic structure. It will contract very vigorously. And some patients may say it contracts even better than sinus. But in a good percentage, over time, that good contraction will wane. The appendix will dilate, just like you see with cardiomyopathy. I think there's a cardiomyopathy of the appendix from, from tachycardia. We see that with the ventricle. I think it happens with the appendix. And if you get cardiomyopathic atria over time from all this tachycardia, then it predisposes to stasis and thrombus formation. And then, you know, if the, you know, these clots then, then will break off, and then you have the embolic stuff. So I think that the architecture itself is important. You have these little lobes that go this way and lobes that go that way versus a, just a tunnel. The multiple lobes are, ace are predisposing the areas for stasis. So you, the chicken wing that I showed yeah. you, that person is at risk even more so than another person that doesn't have it. There's wind sock where it's just a straight little appendix. They're less likely to have clots, but still can, and they're at risk. But these other multiple lobes are little stagnant areas that, that result in thrombus formation. So there are multiple roles attributed. There is some role in uh, blood pressure homeostasis. Um, appendage is a big source of atrial natriuretic peptide, mm, and uh, it has been uh, attributed to that. And uh, uh, the contractility part is there, as the, mm, Marcus mentioned. There is also some regulation. So that mainly that uh, you know uh, hemodynamic. Uh, in the in filling pressures and all that, those are the main. Uh, uh, if you look at left atrium embryologically, like you know, a vast part of the left, unlike the right atrium, which has a lot of muscle, the appendage is pretty much the only real muscle that the left atrium has, basically in that regard. The rest, the whole posterior wall of the left atrium originates from the embryonic sinus stenosis, and they are all venous. They are very thin. And uh, so mm, that's why clots tend to form more, I believe, in that regard. I guess this goes into that term that I've never seen out in the <laughs> which I think is pretty cool. I mean, uh, understanding the appendix and what it does. Questions, comments, what we're so There are about uh, five years, I think, or two years, uh, I think my thing is not to see this as completely biased and not go there because of the value going back and forth. Oh, no, that's not the issue. The issue with valvular atrial fibrillation is that they have a higher risk of uh, forming intraatrial thrombi, not only in the appendage. So uh, just closing the appendage may not take away all the risks, basically, if you want to answer that. Yeah, I think you're right. If you look at how likely you are to form a clot in the left atrium, where it's going to be located, a lot of it's dictated by the etiology of the atrial fib. So if it's like rheumatic, if you really say true rheumatic disease, tremendous number of cases where we show left atrial cavity clots form. And as opposed to the appendix. So, but non valvular atrium, as you define it, the predominant greater than 90% are going to be really housed in the left atrial appendix. So, it's really that's the problem. You can't protect the left atrial cavity with the device. You've got a patient who's more predisposed to have, you know, may, may still have more left atrial appendix clots, but proportionally much greater a number in the left atrium compared to a non valve atrial patient. So, that's the patient to be leery of. And I actually think that we, you know, we're still at the threshold of trying to really sort out who's going to be best identified as patients that need this device. I really like to see patients who have left atrial appendage dysfunction, little stasis. If I see a nice looking appendage, I'm not so sure that that's going to be the source of their stroke. So we don't have any long term data for that, but I think moving forth, we would want to certainly think about that. Is that really the right patient that should have it? I want to end by, if you could just briefly tell us your impression of what, I, what appears to me to be the, the sort of increasing fluidity of cardiology. Uh, here we have an ectophysiologist addressing a neurological issue with a physical, mechanical set of abilities and a diagnostic tool that is now being used for therapeutic and follow-up of therapeutic involvement. Now, this develops becoming very fluid for the benefit of the patient. Can you tell us a little bit more about that for people who are interested in cardiology and doing things related to this therapy? I'll start. Uh, a lot of things in, um, you know, what we are doing uh, has become a team approach, and we cannot do it without it. Like a classic example, um, I mean, I'll show the appendage as an example, because 
uh, it's essentially we are not treating an arrhythmia, so why does electrophysiologists have to be involved in this? So the reason is that we do a lot of ablation and work in the left atrium from atrial fibrillation and all this, so we are very well versed with the techniques that is needed to this. And then uh, on the other hand, uh, this particular, to tackle this problem, we need high-end imaging. Basically, you have to know uh, how it looks, what kind of lobes are there, how are the ostium is. Somebody needs to tell us really, hey, I need, you need to use this size, you know, because if you undersize it, it's going to embolize. And if you oversize it, it may impinge on the mitral valve, which is just down the middle. So you have to be very, it's a crucial aspect of things. So, and so another example for collaboration is um, between cardio multiple facets of cardiology as well as cardiac surgery is uh, like a percutaneous aortic valve. Mm, and uh, uh, so we have realized that a lot of these patients have become very complex and like LVAT patients and uh, they have arrhythmia. So they need electrophysics. So we have to learn what their language. They have to learn our language. The same thing with here. So I think we have found it so much more beneficial to kind of, you know, bounce stuff off each other and then bring everybody together to kind of get a, you know, combined decision, okay, what you, what's the team decision? And so there are things that I, I may think that that appendage is okay, I can implant it and then Marcus may say, no, it's not, it's not a good appendage to do it. So we don't. And so it ends, you know, so it, it always um, bringing the expertise together to tack, uh, tackle a disease. So it's like a, disease specific team or a pro program specific team and so that's kind of where we are going so called heart team approach and I think uh, it's going to be the future. I think you characterized it well and I was going to actually, that was going to be my introduction but you stole it so I didn't take it. It's not a collaboration, it's a partnership. Oops. It's stronger than a collaboration. Collaboration you can do over the you know internet, whatever. Partnerships, you're going to be you know day to day working together in the same area to kind of keep the thing going. So I think partnership is the best characterization of it. And I'm going to end by in my club for academia. Best is very difficult to do. If you're a physician cardiologist, independently working somewhere else. This requires a team, full design team, requires mission based, discovery driven approaches. You cannot do this in private practice. Have a great day. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Appreciate it. Excellent. 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 All right, so I'm glad I brought all my stuff. I, I truly do. I never uh, travel uh, without it. Nice oh, thank you. Yeah, congratulations. We got here. We didn't, nothing was running, but I happened to bring all of my stuff, so we got to run. <laughs> so so there will be a board in Appendiology. Yeah, well, there <laughs> the is. Appendiology board. We are, we are actually adding to the echo board.